century church, the early church, the church that Jesus died to establish, and we want to talk about Jesus himself tonight. Jesus, the humble servant, and I appreciate what Tom read for us in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, because have you ever stopped to really think about humility and what humility is? Humility is not something that we teach in schools a lot these days. It's not something that we learn in the workplace or in, or in the classroom. Humility is something that almost is entirely found uh, within the realms of the Bible and people who would follow after the Bible. Think about it, what the definition of humility is. Not proud or arrogant, to be modest in our attitude. To be low in rank, importance, status, or quality. How many people teach their children today to be low in status or importance? And that that's okay. To be courteously respectful. That's what humility is, to be courteously respectful. With that definition, I want you to think about the events of the past couple of weeks. We've had controversy over flags. We've had controversy over the definition of marriage. And if your Facebook is like my Facebook, it has exploded. You look at modern mainstream media and people yelling at one side or the other. I have seen a lot of folks not demonstrating the attitude of humility, to be courteously respectful. And a lot of the folks that I have seen not be courteously respectful are brothers and sisters in Christ around this country, around the world. They've taken to social media and they are loud, proud, arrogant in their attitudes. They're not trying to win anybody through calm discussion. They want it as brazenly out there as possible and that not that is not necessarily the attitude that Jesus had. The one that we read about in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Jesus died to establish the church. We looked at the church this morning. Let's look tonight at the man who died to found it. We talk about the founding fathers during this week, and what they did for our nation. Let's talk about Christ tonight and what he did for our souls. We want to start in Philippians 2. Two, five. We'll look at each verse, and we'll look at how that verse correlates to other verses in the New Testament. But look at the attitude that Jesus demonstrates of humility. In verse number five, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Let this mind or this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind did Christ have? Well, according to John chapter 1, he had the mind of God. Look at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same way in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now skip to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld the glory even as of the only begotten of the Father. Who is the Word? The Word obviously was Jesus. Jesus is equal with Christ. Or Jesus is Christ. And he's equal with God. John 17 and verse 21. Jesus praying to the Father said, That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us that the world may believe thou hast sent me. 
The mind of Christ is the mind of God. Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. So when we want to look and see what godly humility is, there is no greater example than Jesus Christ. That was his mind. Look at his attitude in verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, the King James says, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. If you have an American standard or an English standard or one of those variants, it'll say that it didn't, he didn't think equality with God was something to be grasped. What's that mean? To be held on to for dear life. When we have something we enjoy, something we think is important, what do we do? We hold on to it for dear life. Jesus, who was in heaven from eternity till eternity, turned loose of all of that for us. He didn't think that staying in heaven was something that he needed to hold on to. He was willing to come down here and to be a sacrifice for us. Think about that. As we look at these next few verses, look at Luke chapter 9. He said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Whoever shall be ashamed of me in my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. And we shall come into his glory in the fathers and all of all the holy angels. We need to be ready to turn loose of ourselves and our desires so that we can be like Christ. We want to have the same heart that the early church did. And we talked about how they had an herb, they had a heart like Christ. Christ was a heart and an attitude of humility to turn loose all of the heavenly glory and come here and to dwell with us. Think about that attitude that he demonstrated. Jesus had never been cold. He had never been hungry. He would never been sick. He never stubbed his toe. He never did any of those things that we suffer on a daily basis. Those unpleasant things that make life light. But he was willing to turn loose of having to come and endure all those things that we do so that he could be the Savior for our sin. That's the attitude that he had. In like fashion, we don't need to be transformed to this world we need to be renewed right Romans chapter 12 1 and 2 that we be living sacrifices verse 1 that's what we have to do in order to have the same attitude of humility we have to be willing to renew ourselves spiritually to be living sacrifices to deny ourselves daily and pick up his cross and follow after him we have to be willing to turn loose of everything that we have and hold on to Christ and his cross and the salvation that he offers, his gospel, with all that we have. Hold on to it for dear life because our eternal life is based upon our ability to have that attitude of humility, to say, I'm willing to turn loose of my life, to have the same mind. That's what Paul is encouraging us to do. And what can we do? That we might have an, a humble attitude. We need to study God's word some more. We need to teach God's word to others. I find that I am humbled a lot of times when I teach. That's why I like teaching Bible classes and preaching. It puts me in God's word a lot. Well, when you really start reading and studying and looking at God's word, I get the same feeling I do when I stand on the, the sand of a seashore, look at the ocean, or stand at the foot of a mountain. Those things make me feel this big sometimes. My parents live out in the backwoods of Tennessee where there are no lights. I mean, they got lights, don't get me wrong, they got lights, but there are not a whole lot of them around. And you walk outside at night and you see every one of the stars I think God created. That makes you feel very small. When you look at God's word, you ought to feel, you ought to feel small sometimes. To be like David, what are man that thou art mindful of him? God, I am just a speck of dust on a speck of dust floating on a bigger speck of dust in the universe. And yet you sent Jesus to die for me. That hopefully helps put
put things in perspective, keeps us humble. So we have that attitude of humility. What about a desire to be humble? It's one thing to, to have a humble attitude. It's another thing to desire to be humble every single day. Let's continue looking at Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Who did all those things for Jesus? He did. God said, Jesus, I've got something for you to do. He said, okay. And he took upon himself, he made himself the form of a servant. He made himself of no reputation, of lowly estate. When you think about all the things that you could do for a living, and this is no slight to anybody, but in the first century, a carpenter was on the bottom end of the totem pole. There were other things that were lower than that. But, you know, you weren't a magistrate. You weren't a, a this or a that that has a lot of importance. You're just a guy who works with raw material. Jesus was a carpenter. Not only was he a carpenter, but he was a carpenter from Nazareth. What good thing comes from, no good thing comes from that area. He was a no good carpenter from a no good town. He was prophesied to come through the line of David, through Judah. That Genesis 3.15 all the way on, we see that. Looked at that this morning. Jesus could have been born to anybody, but he was born to Mary and Joseph. A lowly carpenter in a lowly town. Think about that. He made himself of no reputation. And took upon himself the form of a servant. So that we would have an example of what true humility is. John 17 beginning in verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast gave me to do. O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Think about that. Jesus had glory stretching from eternity to eternity. He let go of that. And he came to this earth, and his birth was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing for her to suffer publicly, was minded to put her away privately. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. We continue reading, we see he was raised from sleep and did just as he was told His parents were almost split up before they got together because of all this. God intervened directly for both of them so they knew what was going on. A lowly birth. But as he's getting ready to go back to the Father, he said, glorify me with the glory I had before the world was. I set it aside, God. Think about what heaven is like. And Jesus set it aside to come here because he desired to make of himself no reputation. To take upon himself that form of a servant, the second part of uh, verse 7. Luke 2 and verse 49. He said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I must be about my father's business? What's going on in Luke 2? Well, Mary and Joseph and Jesus and the family had been in Jerusalem. They'd been there for the feast. They got ready to go home. They went home. They set up camp that evening and said, Hey, honey, where, where's Jesus at? Well, I don't have him. I thought it was with you. No, no, he was with you. I, let's go back and find him. Three days later, they find him. You lose a 12-year-old boy in the city. Where are you going to find him? Probably not in school. Where'd they find Jesus? They found him in school, reasoning with the teachers and the instructors of the law, talking about God and doing his business. He took upon himself the form of a servant, a servant who is obedient unto the will of the master. Jesus was tempted like in all ways as we are, right? 
get without seeing. Twelve-year-old boys want to be doing a lot of other things besides sitting at the feet of a schoolmaster, but that's where he was at. You see that humble attitude and that desire to do the will of somebody greater than you, even as he was a child. Look at John chapter 13 now. He rose from supper and laid aside his garment and took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into, into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that he was girded with. Which is kind of what we have depicted up here. Some Renaissance artist representation of that. You ever stop and think about the attitude of humility it took for Jesus and his desire to show the disciples what true humility was? Let's back out a minute and kind of zoom out and get the context for this. They're in the upper room. Jesus is fixing to get arrested and be crucified the next little bit. But instead, he's having one last meal with them, and he's one of the only guys in the room who knows what's going on. All this stuff's in the mind of Christ, and what are his friends, his disciples, the apostles, what are they arguing and talking about? Who's going to be first in the kingdom? Jesus, the very Son of God, is sitting in the room. I know who's first in the kingdom in here. There is no contest about who is first. Jesus is in the room. And they're arguing about who's going to be first in the kingdom. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels and set them all straight. He could have gotten up and rebuked them for their ignorance. What's he do? He gets up quietly. He goes over to the room. He, he changes clothes. He just wraps himself in a towel. And he gets out water and he begins to wash their feet. You know whose job it was to wash the feet in the first century? The lowliest servant. The servant on the bottom end of the totem pole washes feet. Why? If you are a parent, look at your kids' feet next time they get back from camp or something. We call them grubby camp kids at my house. You've been in a pair of flip-flops for a week solid, running up and down dirt roads. Imagine that. Leather, leather shoes, mud, dirt. You're following behind animals in the street. It's very unpleasant. That's why the lowliest servant in the household gets to wash their feet. Jesus, the Son of God, desired to show them what true humility was. That while they were arguing about who was first, the first guy, Jesus, takes upon himself the lowliest servant job available and washes their feet. And then Peter didn't get it. He said, well, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. He said, well, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you can't go to heaven. Well, just give me a bath. Wash my whole body. Well, Peter, you don't get it. Characteristic for Peter. Sometimes we don't get it either. We miss the, the great example of humility. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He made himself of no reputation. He didn't have to do that, but he desired, greatly desired to be humble and to not only teach humility, but as we say, he talked the talk and walked the walk. He was willing to back up speech with action. He made himself, took upon himself the form of a servant so that we would have an idea of what it took to be in a position of humility. Let's go back to where we started for just a second. Jesus humbled himself. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And remember, men don't, don't have the, all the wonderful things that heaven have. Men get cold and hot and hungry and tired and sick and stub our toes and get splinters and all that stuff you don't get in heaven. But he made himself and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. Hope these little personal pronouns are sticking out to you like they did me. He did these things himself. He humbled 
he emptied himself. Now, he didn't empty himself of the divine nature of what it means to be God. He had that. But he emptied himself of what heaven is. Because heaven is all spirit. Earth here is physical. He emptied himself of all that. Revelation 21, we have a glimpse here of what heaven is like. And I just want to skip to verse 23. I encourage you to read that. And it's just a poor, poor representation of what heaven. John's using words like gold and silver and pearls because he can't describe how wonderful heaven must be. Verse 22, John says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, or there is no need for a, a physical building because God is there. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, because the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb did light thereof. Heaven doesn't need a sun, it doesn't need a moon, it doesn't need stars, because God is there. God is there. Where the streets are paved with gold and the gates are made of pearl and all those precious stones are mentioned because that's the only way John could describe something so precious as heaven. That's where Jesus has lived since before time began. That's where he is at now and for a brief span of time. He put himself in a position where he could show humility for us all. He humbled himself. He emptied himself of the glory and the richness and the preciousness of heaven. What was the greatest sacrifice Christ made? I don't imagine being in heaven and have been in heaven forever. There is no beginning of time. It's hard for us to comprehend that. Jesus gave that up. That was a great sacrifice. A great demonstration of humility for us. And sometimes we we overlook that to look at the cross, which is supreme and important. But it's not the only sacrifice that Jesus made. Not only was he humble, and he put himself in a position where he could be humble. He was obedient even unto death. John chapter 9. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night come with... When no man can work, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And Jesus said, I have light and work to accomplish. Did he know when he spoke those words that though that was going to end in his death, that the end of the work was going to be a sacrifice for us? He did. And he was still willing to go and to do the job. He put himself in a position of humility. Did he want to die? Did he desire that his life should be taken in the most cruelest means that the world has yet devised to kill someone? He said, Father, if thou wilt be willing, remove this cup from me. God, if we can do this any other way, that would be fantastic. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared to him an angel to strengthen him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And it's that where his great drops of blood fall into the ground. He was stressed to the absolute max, knowing what he was going to face. He said, if there's any other way, let's do it that way. But God, if this is the way, I will do it that way. He was in a position to demonstrate the most extreme example of humility, to give himself for us. What are some ways that we can be in positions of humility? We can serve others. The way Jesus served us. We can serve others, especially those who have no means to repay us for what we do for them. That's a way to show our humility, to not take credit or glory for something. It's one thing for us to be involved in a work. Say, hey, Josh, I want to go and do this. And if I do that, y'all put my name in the bulletin, right? We'll put it up on the PowerPoint for everybody to see it. And we'll give you a giant medal that says, I'm humble, and you can wear it around. I know people who donate a lot of money to different things so that they can have their name on a cornerstone. Or make sure you put my name in the back of the magazine that says contributors, right? It's not what it's about. 
not why Jesus did it. He did it because we needed it, and it's not something we could do for ourselves. There's no way we can repay Christ for what he did for us, for leaving heaven to come, to suffer, and to be crucified for our sins. That's how he established his church. Remember Matthew 16, 18 from this morning? He said, I will build my church. And he placed himself in a position of humility so that he could do just that. We serve others, especially when they can't repay us. There's no way we can repay Christ. We can repay God for the things that were done to purchase our salvation, but he did it anyway. Jesus is humility, and I don't know any other way to say it at all. When you want to see what humility is, it is Jesus. Not it was, because remember, he was, is, and will forever be. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, that is what humility is. That's what it looks like. Go back sometime and look at those little, those little words. Himself, took upon himself, made himself. How do we get to be humble? We make ourselves to be humble. We hold ourselves to a lower status a lower importance is that what the world says no the world says scream and cry with the masses make your voice heard Jesus said just do the work we keep our head down we be Christians we do what we can to be a light in the community think about humility humility is that that not being arrogant, right? To having that modest attitude. To be courteously respectful. That's on Facebook. I know you disagree with folks that are out there. I know you yell at the news. I hope you do. I hope I'm not the only one. I understand things in the world make us angry. That we don't agree with some things that go on. But I hope that we can be courteously respectful. That we can demonstrate a Christ-like attitude of humility when we combat darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places and all the things the Bible tells us to do, we can do it with an attitude of meekness and humility. Why? Because that's what Jesus would do. You want to see what it looks like? Look at Philippians 2. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at that in action. We should always be humble. We can't get to heaven by ourselves. There's nothing you can do in and of yourself to get to heaven. You have to submit to the will of God in order to do that, and submission takes humility. Tonight, if you need to be humble to obedience, to say that I can't get to heaven myself and I need God to help me get there, the Lord adds to the church. And if you believe in Christ, this great example of humility, if you're willing to repent of your sins and confess his name, and be baptized into water for the forgiveness of sins. That's what gets you into heaven. Your obedience coupled with God's grace, and the Lord will add you to his church. And you can go to heaven, that glorious place that Christ gave up for you. You can go and live with him forever. Sometimes we all need to be humble. And I appreciate y'all. Y'all keep me pretty humble. I like to pick on folks and maybe keep other folks humble too. We, we do that. Try not to let our heads get too big, our shoulders too broad. If you look at your life and your heart and your mind and your actions tonight, maybe you find yourself just a little bit humble. Say, you know what, I haven't quite been acting the way Christ would act in these situations, whatever they are in my life. Maybe you need to handle things that were done publicly, publicly. You can come forward and get forgiveness for those things as publicly as they are known. You can have prayers for strength and encouragement. Jesus had a wonderful attitude of humility. We can demonstrate that exact same attitude of humility as the invitation is extended as we stand and as we sing. Yeah.